So, hey, Charles. Hello, Lauren. I wanted to get your thoughts about this exciting vote that happened in Denver yesterday, just an hour from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, Tell me about the of, vote. Yeah, tons of people are already aware of this, but for a little background, uh, yesterday, Denver became the first city in the U.S. to vote to decriminalize psilocybin mushrooms. And the vote was close. I think it was like 51 to 49 percent. And so they're not legal. What this does is it basically prohibits the city government from using their resources to penalize adults over 21 mm -hmm. for personal use or possession of psilocybin. And for a long time, this has been a schedule one drug, but more and more it's being pushed to be moved down to lower schedule or decriminalized or legalized. Right. And a lot of people think of you know, decriminalizing as the first step toward broader legalization. I was just looking and in 2005, Denver was the first city in America to legalize or to decriminalize marijuana. And then like five, seven years later, now it's fully legal for recreational use and everything. So before I ask anything more specific, I, I'll just ask what you think about this. Well, I think it'll be the end of society as we know it. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm only half joking. Um, I think that the uh, evolution that um, the use of psilocybin mushrooms can be part of and I'm not saying that they necessarily are going to revolutionize your life or change your consciousness, but they are part of a healing process that changes the um, condition of the atoms of society, you know, the, 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 the human beings that make up society. So I think it, it will have a bigger effect than just, you know, another way for people to have fun or something like that. Um, the, Psilocybin mushrooms, you know, they're known for, I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons to take them off schedule one. Schedule one is for substances that have uh, no therapeutic uh, use, which is pretty absurd for psilocybin mushrooms because they can really help people heal from trauma, uh, get people off addiction, um, help them with depression, um, I can't even remember all the all the uses that they they have therapeutically, mm -hmm. uh, and and beyond that, you know, beyond treating people who are are you know sick in some way, um, they're known to expand consciousness, mm -hmm. which is a term that I'm a little bit suspicious of. It's as if some people are more conscious than others because theirs has been expanded and other people's haven't. Mm -hmm. What I prefer. To, to say is that they um, open up consciousness to things that most people in our society are not conscious of already. So they're, they are a kind of uh, a therapy for the blind spots and the, the, the conceptual and perceptual blind spots um, that people in our society generally have. And it's not just a mental thing. It's also these blind spots correspond to states of being that are often um, quite alien to our society. So it's a question of what do they help you become conscious of? And it could be conscious of the livingness of all things, the aliveness of the world, uh, the play of synchronicity that, that uh, touches our lives that's ordinarily invisible uh, and that we become more aware of under the influence of these medicines. And so these therapeutic effects are bound to change society as we know it, uh, because society as we know it depends on a more limited state of consciousness and perception that is the norm today. Yeah, what do you think the deeper indication for society is then for mushrooms being decriminalized? Or maybe what yeah. is it a signal of in society even? Yeah, it's a signal of society's readiness for these kinds of healing and these states of consciousness to, to um, come into the mainstream or for the mainstream to move to them. In a way, the, the drug warriors of past times, they were kind of right in a way that 
this would destroy society as we know it because they were so foreign to what society was. And, and now that, that's really changed, I think, that, that because maybe of decades of um, illicit uh, psychedelic work, but also all of, the other, uh, all of the other things that are happening in the consciousness movement and, and the healing that people are going through, it's made society more ready for these things. So, that, so legalization or whatever, decriminal, decriminalization, it's a signal that society as a whole is no longer holding these medicines and the transformations and states of being that accompany them in the realm of the uh, abnormal. It's not excluding them anymore. It's not attempting to keep them out of reality anymore. So that's a significant barometer of a social change. Mm -hmm. It makes me, part of why I wanted to ask you about it is because I feel like for a lot of people, mushrooms can give them like a direct experience of interbeing, which you talk about a lot. And, and you, you've mentioned like part of why you're able to write what you do about this new story is because you think it means that people are ready for it. Yeah. Yes, the story of interbeing. Um, yeah, mushrooms definitely can. I'm not saying that they always will, but for certain people who are, are uh, ready and at, at a point in their lives where, where this transition is ripe, um, a, a powerful psychedelic experience will shift their perception of who they are what a self is, who am I, and how, how do I relate to the other? The, the change can go that deep. And, and so it does uh, uh, catalyze a transition out of the story of separation. Yeah, I mean, I've been saying pretty much the same thing for a long time. And uh, obviously, I'm not the only one who's saying this kind of thing. And, uh, but something's changed in the last few years where what I'm saying no longer seems so crazy and it's no longer so marginal. Although at least on some days I think that, on other days I feel like totally like an alien, you know, on the wrong planet. But I do think that there's more receptivity to the kinds of things I'm speaking to and speaking about. And, and it's uh, related to the realizations that people have with psychedelic medicines. And my own work is informed by them to some extent. I can't say that, uh, that I'm uh, you know, a dedicated psychonaut uh, or that I've been profoundly healed by them, but they are medicines and, and beings to whom I feel uh, great gratitude mm -hmm. and reverence. Yeah, is there any particular direct experience you've had of mushrooms that you feel like sharing? Um, actually, I haven't had really super powerful experiences on mushrooms. Mm -hmm. It's not really my medicine. Um, and, and I think that maybe someday we'll have a uh, deeper understanding of which medicines are right for which people mm -hmm. and, and which conditions of the soul they can be used to, to address, to heal. Um, and maybe there are people out there who really have these fine distinctions already in development, but I personally am no expert on it. Mm -hmm. All I know is that it's really not my medicine, hmm. but it's a beautiful medicine and I can, I can recognize that. Sure. I haven't done this research myself, but I saw Paul Stamets speak recently mm -hmm. and he said, We've never seen a drug with such profound therapeutic and medicinal benefits for things like anxiety, depression, and lots of other things that I'm not aware of or that we haven't researched yet with supposedly zero chance of addiction and zero adverse effects. Yeah, it's pretty darn safe, you know? I mean, compared to say alcohol. Um, right, it makes me You can't really wonder. overdose on it, you know? Right. How can something like that have be kept illegal and 
and why do you think they were made illegal in the first place? It seems yeah, well, obviously, obviously they're not kept illegal because they're actually dangerous. They're not actually dangerous, uh, except they are dangerous if you want to maintain a society based on scarcity, competition, exploitation, extraction, and endless growth. If that is your premise, that this kind of society is the right kind of society, then the states of consciousness that open and open up through uh, psychedelics are, are anathema. They are incompatible with the maintenance of that system. So there's a very good reason that they were made illegal. The, the, the powers that be, or that were, <laughs> intuitively recognized these things as a threat. So whatever addiction, you know, they, they, they conjured up various bugbears in order to uh, justify the criminalization of these medicines. But obviously, like, it doesn't take much research to understand that that's not true and, and, and they are powerful and not very dangerous. I mean, I think that they can be abused, you know, like any medicines can. Um, but even if they're abused compared to, uh, you know, opiates or, or um, amphetamines or, or alcohol, they're really not that damaging. Or possibly even pharmaceutical medications. Right, or pharmaceutical medications. And that's you know, another reason, another way that they don't really fit into the, the matrix. Um, because even though they're, they're powerfully therapeutic, there's very little money to be made in them compared to pharmaceuticals, which you can patent and, and uh, uh, enclose in intellectual property rights and make billions and billions of dollars off them. I mean, you could make you know, medicinal preparations out of, out of mushroom extracts and stuff like that, but, but the profit potential is not anything like it is for pharmaceuticals. So the drug companies, it's not that they're evil necessarily, um, although sometimes I think they are. Um, it's not that they're, they're evil in, 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 trying, in, in neglecting them, um, normal, generally speaking. It's just like there's just no incentive for them to, to do the research, you know? And luckily there are, there are many idealistic people who really care about healing and who have done this research for years and decades, barely making, making a living. I mean, you know, financing the research at their own expense. Finally today, they're starting to be recognized and receive institutional support. And as that happens, and this is another, another aspect of the uh, migration of these medicines to a mainstream or to a society that's ready for them. Now they're receiving institutional support and, and we're seeing uh, evidence, scientifically verified evidence that of the therapeutic power of these medicines. Oh yeah, and it's like just begun, like wildly behind times on researching these things yeah i hope i hope it'll increase the amount of research that can be done decriminalizing it mm -hmm. yeah so you can't patent nature most of the time although some companies try to uh, but apparently you can criminalize it which yeah. i find curious like what do you think about this criminalization of nature in general it's very arrogant I mean, to, to say of a plant that you are illegal or a fungus, that you are illegal, you get all part of nature illegal to subsume a greater into a lesser. Like law is less than natural and nature. And we're trying to feature these, these puny human constructs. It's, it's really arrogant. Um, yeah, it, it's... Uh, the audacity to even do that is also a sign of a, of a certain mindset, uh, the mindset of domination and, and human uh, exclusion from nature. And, and I'm glad that people are starting to wake up to, to the uh, folly and arrogance of that. Mm -hmm. And mushrooms in general, I mean, criminalizing nature in general is a strange idea to me. But listening to people like Paul Stamets and Terence McKenna, it seems more and more like mushrooms are super intelligent beyond what we might currently know. 
like I, I think you said six miles of mycelium are contained in like one inch of soil. Yeah, healthy soil is more complex than brain tissue and uses a lot of the same signaling molecules. Um, I think most, if not all, of the neurotransmitters are present in the mycelium that looks of soil. So it's not uh, a poetic metaphor or new age delusion to think that these beings might actually be intelligent or that soil might actually have consciousness. It's, it's uh, I mean, you can't prove it through by, by saying, well, you know, the neurotransmitters are there, the complexities there, the, the um, nonlinear feedback and so forth. You can't prove it that way, but it's not a rant, uh, delusion to think that it could be true. We just don't know. And I think it would be a good start to say, we don't know, uh, mm -hmm. rather than to say, oh yeah, we know we're the, we're the soul consciousness around here. When people are experiencing the medicines, they often have an experience of, of interfacing with an intelligent being, with a mysterious, grand, magnificent being. Um, it's a, uh, as much of a felt experience as the experience of, of interacting with a human being. Um, and, and, and that moment where you realize that I'm not the only self here. It's only a, a psychopath who sees other beings as props in his own play and has no conception of the beingness of others. So you could say that uh, the dominant society, the dominant culture on earth is in that sense psychopathic by diminishing or negating the beingness of our relations that surround us on this earth. So the legalization or decriminalization of mushrooms, um, cannabis, and, and hopefully more and more um, um, psychedelic plants and, and fungi, um, that is an indication that maybe we are stepping out of that psychopathic relationship to nature because it is, yeah, it's a step toward accepting our role as participants rather than dominators on this earth. Yeah. Uh, Paul Stamos has so many amazing things to say about it that it almost suggests like that mushrooms it's almost like they connect almost the entire planet Earth, the mycelial network. Yeah. And the <laughs> function mimics the brain. And right. they even are our direct descendants, apparently, which I didn't know and didn't learn in school. Yeah, and imagine what happens when you, when you fracture the, the, this connected continent with roads. Mm -hmm. uh, the entire... I mean, I don't know, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but, but as far as I know, the entire continent east of the Mississippi was one mycelial mat, um, or, you know, not many. Um, like the, these are vast beings and, and you could, yeah, say that the whole continent and to some extent the whole world, you know, these communications um, happen not only through mycelia, but also through you know, aromatic chemicals, through the um, uh, through bird songs, uh, through whale songs, uh, through uh, elect electrical signals that go through plankton and stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that that leads me to think that this world is one gigantic connected brain. Mm -hmm. And now, and when we when we chop it up with roads and um, uh, mess up the the electromagnetic communication with um, cell phone towers and, and other kinds of um, electromagnetic radiation. Um, and when we destroy the, the wildlife and the birds and the whales, then the planet becomes less able to communicate with itself. It's like its consciousness degrades. Mm -hmm. And then one result of that is gonna be climate change mm -hmm. because you can't maintain coherence anymore. This is something that's, that's not really recognized in the dominant narrative of climate change, which is all, of this, all about greenhouse gases. And, and the idea that we can 
uh, continue our ways as long as we go switch to a carbon neutral energy source. That just is, to me, it's just delusional. It, it ignores really the livingness of the planet and treats it as if it were just a machine. Well, when, when, we, when we encompass the, the complexity and the, what looks to me like the consciousness of this earth, then we realize that the changes have to go a lot deeper than switching to a different fuel source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes me think of a couple of the concerns that have come to mind since seeing this decriminalization. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious if you're concerned at all about people taking a sacred magical plant medicine and turning it into like an industrial, industrially produced commercial recreational drug. Uh, yeah, I am a little concerned about that. That's happened with cannabis, you know, although that predates uh, decriminalization. I mean, the indoor hydroponics grow operations have been going on for a while, you know. And in fact, they were developed in the context of criminalization. Uh, so yeah, this is not, um, to, to decriminalize uh, mushrooms, that's just one step toward uh, relating to earth in a sacred way. The mushrooms should be grown um, reverentially uh, and, and hopefully by many, many individual people in their own, um, you know, their own backyards. I mean, a lot of them grow wild anyway, uh, and they should be harvested respectfully and, and you know, not over harvested. And they should be um, grown and harvested in a way that is consistent with the message that they are bringing, which is the message of interbeing and the message that these are beings. You know, you don't just like grab them and use them indiscriminately. Uh, so maybe we still have, yeah, so I think it is a concern that should be talked about so that we can connect the dots uh, so, that, so that the one dot of, wow, it's all alive. I'm part of everything. The universe is sacred. That dot is connected to where did this medicine come from? How is it produced? How is it harvested? Uh, that, the, so yeah, it's an important conversation. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts on how we can maintain the, the reverence for mushrooms as they become legalized, as they be, become mainstream? I think those who understand that need to speak out uh, and, and frame the beings, the mushrooms, uh, in a way that helps people realize that. And to do that in a respectful way, not a condemnatory way. But, but it's, a, it's a natural understanding that people, I think, are ready to step into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering about it. My roommate and I were talking about it because of course here in Colorado, uh, marijuana is totally legal and it, it's weird. It's become difficult to even figure out like who grew this and how did they grow it and is it organic and mm -hmm. did the person grow it with love or is it just some like disgruntled person yeah. trying to make a living? <laughs> well, I mean, so this brings up, the the issue that gets obscured in a polarized debate, which is one of the main themes I've been talking about recently, in the case of cannabis, the, what's being obscured is the issue of industrial agriculture versus ecological place-based local agriculture. Mm -hmm. So anything grown industrially, whether it's beef in, in feedlots or soybeans in gigantic monocultures, or cannabis in indoor hydroponic grow labs, like this is all an abuse of the earth. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it comes out in the, in the medicine itself when it's not treated well. You know, cannabis is very forgiving. It, it's a very loving plant, if you'll allow me to anthropomorphize cannabis. Uh, it's a very loving plant. It's called the kind herb, right? Kind bud. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite tolerant of the abuse we're putting on it, but. I'm sure that, that if you grow it in your garden and really take good care of it and do ceremonies around it, et cetera, et cetera, I bet you're gonna have a much more potent, not necessarily in terms of 
how much THC it has, but you're going to have a much more helpful medicine. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there a, a substance that you hope is next in the, the domino? It seems like maybe we have a domino effect that's begun. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not only natural substances, also some of the synthetic ones like LSD, MDMA, they have um, powerful therapeutic uses as well. And and their own particular flavor, their own particular way of shifting consciousness. Uh, so ultimately, you know, all of them should be, and some of them maybe are more dangerous than others, uh, require more caution. There needs to be a culture of understanding around them and a culture of, of people, you know, who are, are skilled at administering and facilitating the experiences uh, so that the medicines can really reach their potential uh, as aids to human development. You know, I'm not, so I'm not saying everyone just go indiscriminately take whatever drug is available. Um, although a lot of people do that and still, even without the right set and setting and coaching and, and facilitation still have powerful healing experiences. But ideally we would have a culture around them and they would be treated uh, with as much care as pharmaceutical medicines are today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would be taken that seriously. It's like, wow, these are amazing medicines. Yeah. Yeah, the opportunity to have a world of 7.5 billion people with access to all of the plant medicines and, and even like you said, synthetic medicines available that's quite an opportunity society has mm -hmm. maybe quite a responsibility even yeah like you're saying yeah i think those are those are most of the burning questions i have did you have anything else you wanted to share about I think I've said most of what I want to say. That I, I could also. Maybe there's maybe the intelligence in these substances is such that their their entry into legal, you know, mainstream society has a wisdom in its timing that we may not understand. Um, that they made themselves available to just a few people on the fringes for a period, and then they became part of the counterculture for a period. And maybe that timing was just right. And now it, they're entering a new phase. Uh, and we can be grateful that that is happening and grateful that we have become ready for that to happen. Mm 